Good evening to you. Getting on the housing market has never been more difficult and here in the south it's not helped because we have some of the most expensive places to live anywhere in the country. Today a government white paper set out plans for what can be done to fix what ministers are calling our broken housing market and make homes more affordable. Well here's what first time buyers are dealing with in our region. In Winchester over the past 10 years house prices have risen by 30 32%, in the last year. Yes, a two-bed flat in 2007 there would have cost you around £169,000. It's about 249000 now. And in Portsmouth, the average flat has risen from around 125000 ten years ago to £156,000 now. In Southampton, a two-bed flat on average cost £116,000. That's in 2006. Now it's £146,000. Prices have gone up, but wages haven't as quickly, and mortgages are more difficult to get. So will today's raft of measures really tackle the problem for those wanting to buy a home? Phil Hornby has been investigating. Lisa and her partner rent. They'd love to buy. They don't think they ever will. We do feel quite trapped, yeah. We've, we've been talking about um, starting a family, but we just don't feel like we could do it in this area because the, the price of of both renting and mortgages is far too high. This man says he has a plan. Prices are too high, we are not building enough homes and this white paper is a radical blueprint to change this once and for all. He knows since the Tories mass house building programme in the 1950s every government has failed on housing and yet they all recognise there's a problem, they all say they have a way of solving it. Now housing shortages are more serious than ever, house prices and the price of renting higher than ever and out of the reach of many, many people, especially in the south. One thing he's not doing is changing the rules about building on the green belt. We promised the British people that the green belt was safe in our hands and that is still the case. But he said the government's determined to build the right homes in the right places, speed up the business of house building and help small independent building companies. MPs agree there is a crisis. Some blame their local councils. There's a World West adversarial Lib Dem lazy planning attitude in my constituency. Others wanted more help for their councils. In Brighton and Hove alone, there are 26,000 people on the housing waiting list. So why will he not answer the question about why he won't lift the borrowing cap so councils can start building again? And some Tories too called for more council houses. Isn't the answer to greater empower the public sector? Yeah, yeah. The south is one of the parts of the country where the problems with our housing market are at their worst. But as a government, we must make sure that young people there can get on the housing ladder. It's not acceptable to say they don't have a chance. So we need to build more homes. That's what this white paper is about, to make housing more affordable over time. But we also need to provide help to people right now, and that's the help to buy scheme and start a home. All governments talk the talk on housing. The question is, can this one walk the walk? Phil Hornby, ITV News, Westminster. Well, earlier I spoke to David Orr from the National Housing Federation, which represents all of the housing associations in England. They provide homes for around 11% of the population, and he says they're keen to offer more. I think the most important message is that it really is time to get building. Um, we now know that people all over the country want to see new homes built and actually want to see new homes built in their neighbourhoods because the housing crisis is not now something that we just think affects other people. We think it affects us, our families, our children, our parents, and we need now to do something very substantial to fix it. Now, there are huge sensitivities around developing on green belt land, not least in conservative heartlands. Do people just have to accept now that there are other priorities? I think the first priority is ensuring that ordinary people have a decent, affordable home in which they can build their lives and be confident about facing the world. That's the first priority. But the good news is that even although I think we should build on little corners of the green belt, it's not, we don't need to take up very much of it. We just need to be rational and thoughtful and think, where do we build that will allow people to have that great start in life? And a lot of the green belt isn't great. It's not of any environmental 
use. It's not places that people go for leisure. Now, government figures actually show that the number of surplus houses has actually risen in the last 20 years, from 800,000 to 1.4 million. Rather than build more, is it time we better use what we already have? I think if you have a job in the Thames Valley and there's an empty property near the Durham coal fields, that's not much use to you. It's not very helpful to look at that without being more thoughtful about where the homes are, where the jobs are. There is no way around this. We need to see a significant programme of building new homes. Thank you very much, David Orr, for speaking to us. Thank you. In other news, a cyclist in Brighton has been arrested on suspicion of committing 24 sexual assaults in under a week. The 20-year-old man targeted women across the city, including on Old Steen, or while on his bicycle. He was caught by detectives while attacking two women. An 83-year-old man had to be rescued after falling down the CERN Abbas Giant in Dorset. Fire crews from across the county in Hampshire, as well as a specialist team from Pool, took part in the recovery last night. It took an hour and a half before he was successfully lifted in a stretcher to be taken to Pool Hospital. Churches here in the south have raised nearly £6,000 to help refugees in the region. Churchgoers from across the Diocese of Winchester donated money to help the Red Cross in resettling the refugees. There are now families in Winchester, Basingstoke and Andover. An arson attack at a cricket pavilion in Sussex has put the future of a local team at risk. £10,000 worth of equipment was being stored in the building, which was raised to the ground in Bognor Regis. Well, now, Aldwick Cricket Club is making a desperate attempt to raise enough money to keep on playing, as Sam Holder now reports. The ashes of Aldwick Cricket Club. Not the name of an amateur test series, but what's left of the local club's pavilion totally destroyed in a mindless arson, now putting Aldwick's future in doubt. Ian Guppy is on the club's committee and in a bizarre twist also works for the fire service and took the first calls about the arson. It was quite surreal because as soon as she said where she lived I knew what she was talking about and from hearing the second and third calls I knew exactly what was on fire so I was trying to contact people from our club. We deal with numerous calls of, on a daily basis it never really, you kind of become detached, you know. The fact this is something that is personal to me, involves me, involves my family, involves my friends, um, it just, just numb. Inside was equipment for the club's 51 players, from their teens to their 70s. Police still don't know who's responsible, but the building was broken into the night before. Nothing was taken, but now nothing is left. Brutal honesty, it could end us. It could absolutely end us. You know, we haven't got large bank accounts. We don't have large benefactors. Everybody that comes here and, and works at the club volunteers. So actually, it could end us. The building is council owned, so insured. But everything inside, from kit to microwaves to speakers, has been lost. Aldwick Cricket Club have launched a crowdfunding appeal online to raise the £10,000 needed. The season's due to begin on the wicket here at the beginning of April. And that means Aldwick have to find a new pavilion and all the equipment they need within the next two months. This is a community club at heart, and they're hoping their season isn't out before they've even come to the crease. Sam Holder, ITV News, Bognor Regis. Surrey County Council has abandoned controversial plans to raise council tax by 15%. The Conservative-led authority had wanted the extra cash to sort out a crisis in social care, blaming government cuts. Surrey has now announced plans for an increase of 4.99% instead. That would cost a band D taxpayer an extra £63 per year. I believe we are now at a point where I believe there's a way forward which does not involve a council tax referendum and I believe the government now really does understand the whole issue about adult social care, the crisis it's facing the country and about looking for a solution. I think the Prime Minister and I think the Chancellor are both and certainly the Secretary of State for Health, they're both all on that we need to do something about this and I think this, this is the way forward. 
Festival has confirmed it'll be held at the Lulworth Estate in Dorset this year. The music festival had been based at Robin Hill on the Isle of Wight for the past 16 years, but organiser Rob DeBank says a licence has been granted for it to move to the new site. A baby orangutan rescued by a Sussex-based charity has had her first day at school. Boina, who's just one, was found by International Animal Rescue in West Borneo. The orphan had been kept as a pet, but now she's learning skills such as foraging and tree climbing so she can be released back into the wild. She's beautiful. You're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Thank you as always for choosing us. We do appreciate it. Coming up. Why seagulls were a hot topic in Parliament today. Are they a seaside favourite or a seaside scourge? As always, more on all of our stories, do head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Any views or news, give us a call, please. 0808 1010 095, the number to ring. Or you can get in touch via Facebook. Or why not send us a tweet at ITV. Meridian. Now, keeping children safe online can be worrying for parents. Often, mums and dads feel they don't know enough about their children's digital lives and how it might leave them vulnerable. Well, new research shows sexting, sharing intimate photos and messages, is a growing trend among young people. Experts say it's becoming more normalised, with many youngsters not realising the consequences it could have on their emotional and mental well-being and future. Well, on Safer Internet Day, Hampshire police are trying to tackle the issue. Here's Emma Wilkinson. A video by young people for young people. This, the winning entry in a Hampshire police competition for high school pupils to create a film about sexting. It's becoming more and more common. New research suggests half of 13 to 17 year olds have seen naked pictures of someone they know being shared around their school or community. Here, teenagers from Robert May's school in Odium screen their new prevention film. People thought, well, it's probably fine because my friend did it and it's like it can sort of have repercussions just because one person did it, it then spreads and spreads and spreads. I think it's certainly something that some teenagers feel they must, must do in a relationship. How long it takes if you did send it to take it down, how it affects you in future, um, future job applications, all very scary. The film's message is that a nude picture can spread like wildfire once sent to someone else. And a police survey of more than 900 Hampshire secondary school pupils gives a worrying insight into their digital lives. More than a third said they, or someone they knew, had been involved or affected by sexting. 40% said they wouldn't know what to do if images were shared or used against them. And 30% either weren't sure of the law or didn't think it was illegal for under-18s to take, send or share sexual images. But Hampshire police say this campaign is not about criminalising young people. This is about educating and intervention and safeguarding young people. So we don't want to create a fear of the fact that they're going to get in trouble with the police because we want them to come forward. We want them to seek that help. A lot of the downward spiral in mental health and wellbeing is when young people actually think they've done something wrong and they'll hold it in and then it'll get more and more and more out of control. And that's when they end up at further risk. The internet today is driven by images and videos. And while experts say this is often used positively by young people, it can also magnify the risks and pressures they face. Emma Wilkinson, ITV News, Fleet. Well, more and more people sadly are being diagnosed with dementia every day, and it is an issue that many businesses are having to become aware of. Well, Heathrow Airport is one of them. They now run a training course to show staff how to spot the signs that a passenger may have dementia and how they can assist them. Well, now some taxi drivers are also becoming dementia aware, as often sufferers use taxis because they find public transport too stressful to negotiate. James Webster has more. There you are. Getting out of the house for Cyril George isn't as easy as it once was. If I, if I can't get up. He's 71 and was diagnosed with dementia 18 months ago. Well, I like to go any, uh, anywhere I can. I go to three or four different uh, places and it, they're not all the same, which is good. 
Cyril relies on taxis to get him around, sometimes on his own, sometimes with his wife Eileen. I can make sure the taxi driver knows where we're going, where he's going, um, and often arrange for him to be picked up at the same place and brought home again. Um, if Cyril is left on his own in the taxi, um, he might get some of this wrong and he might get upset. If you knew the person... Some councils are now providing courses to help drivers recognise when a passenger has dementia and understand what extra help they might need. Sometimes uh, we can't recognise actually what's the you know, problem with um, customers. People with dementia, they react to your reactions because they're confused. I just think it, it's worth two hours of my time for today, yeah? Very interesting, yeah? Several sessions have already taken place, more are planned. When they come along to our training courses, they realise that it's not something to fear, it's something that you can help with. And that's got to be good for the whole of society, really, that we all improve our knowledge and understanding. All right, where are we going? Cyril is already planning more days out. I have the assurance of knowing that he is safe and that safety is so important to Cyril. His world has got smaller and he will go to places where he knows people understand about dementia. We all need each other. We need customers, they need drivers. And if, if we're lucky, every one of us will live long enough that we will probably be in the same situation as Cyril and hoping that somebody will help us out as well. The hope is such training will allow those with dementia to enjoy their independence for much longer. James Webster, ITV News. Now, as a celebrity chef, he spends his day preparing and tasting food. But for Tom Kerridge, the downside was he put on lots of weight. Now, the 43-year-old who owns a restaurant in Buckinghamshire has been on a weight loss mission with quite amazing results. Our reporter Lauren Hall caught up with him. On the food scene, right. his name is instantly recognisable, even if he isn't these days. It's fair to say Tom Kerridge looks a little different following his dramatic weight loss. So this is a chef's jacket that I grew out of. I was still too big for that. It's massive. Loads of great chefs have signed it wishing me happy birthday for my 40th birthday. It's always something for me to reflect on and remind me of where we were and now where we're going. It was his 40th which prompted his change in lifestyle. Since then, he's lost 11 stone. A really good friend of mine kind of describes it. It's like halfway to death. And you go, OK. So you kind of think, you think, all right, I've got to 40. That's halfway there. What have I, done? What have I achieved? Where am, where am I at? And then what am I going to do for the next 40 years? He started exercising each day and also devised his own eating plan, which he calls the Tom Kerridge Dopamine Diet. Essentially, it involves drastically cutting down on carbs and focusing on foods thought to boost the so-called happy hormone. Do people really need another diet, another set of rules telling them what they can and can't eat? I mean, ultimately, should it just come down to eating less and exercising more? Yeah, I mean, that methodology of going, use more calories than you're consuming, completely works. That's 100%, that's proven. But the reality of that is our day-to-day -day lives are very, very different. Where if you're counting calories and working out the numbers every single day of what you're trying to do, one day you go over by 100 calories, you're riddled with guilt. It's a very simple rule for me. If it's starchy or it's sweet, don't eat it. And, and it's that easy, but you can have as much of anything else. Alcohol, for him though, is now strictly off limits. Do you still allow yourself the occasional glass of wine or no. pint? No? no, nothing. Completely teetotal, yeah, three and a half years. I think the best way of describing it, I have a switch, not a dial. There's not, a, there's, it doesn't, there's not like a little bit. There's either, it's either on or off. So the minute we've, with the switch, the alcohol switch is off. He certainly switched on in other ways. The owner of two award-winning pubs, one of which has two Michelin stars. The industry, though, is not without its challenges. I think the next couple of years with the Brexit will be interesting to see because produce will change. Movement of staff, that's going to be key to this industry because, you know, so many, so many staff within the hospitality trade are European. So whether they, um, whether they still fancy moving here or not, we'll have to wait and see. So, you know, there are going to be a lot of challenges facing us. But after 25 years as a chef, he says there's still a lot to celebrate.
it's the most exciting and diverse industry that's going forward. Uh, yes, it's facing issues, but that's only the same as any other industry. We're now being seen on the world stage as being a great place to come and eat. When I first started cooking, no one wanted to, you know, food in England was awful. And now it's being seen, you know, some of the chefs are making noise. We're being asked to cook all over the world. Lots of us are doing two or three gigs a year, you know, overseas, reflecting and showcasing British produce. And that's absolutely amazing. He's now in better health, as is the industry he's working in, both of which have changed beyond recognition. Lauren Hall, ITV News. Now, they are part of the fabric of our seaside towns, but seagulls have been discussed in Parliament today because some people think they're a bit of a nuisance. Yes, ministers are being urged to take action to protect seaside areas. The birds have been criticised for their droppings, nests and noise, but also for being aggressive, especially during the breeding season, with some towns even reporting attacks, with people ending up in A&E. In Brighton today, people told us what they think of the birds. We hate them. Why? Because yeah, they're always them. taking the rubbish out of the beans. And they start to peck at the rubbish and I went to get the rubbish to remove it and they was, it nearly attacked me. Um, one swipe for my burger once. It happens, you know. Yeah. But do I mind them? Do I mind them? Not at all, no. It's part of the seaside, it's part of the town. What's your views on this? Paula Tidy from Brighton says, unfortunately it's our fault that they scavenge as we leave our bins out. They have learnt that it's easier to scavenge than to hunt. Lynn Brown says, I absolutely love them and enjoy hearing them in the morning. It's just part of the charm of being by the seaside. Sam Randall writes, I had a whole sandwich snatched from my hand by a <laughs> seagull while walking in pool. Its wings whacked me in the head yeah. and I was quite shocked. I think something needs to be done. Yes, I'm not sure what. Claire Monkton tells us she loves them they're bold loud and know what they want and only steal food because they want to survive long live the humble gull long thank live you. all of you thank <laughs> yeah, you for your thank you again comments simon's with us now simon you have that great picture do you remember of the birds taking an ice cream from somebody's hand you probably don't remember I don't, i've got no idea what you're talking about but i have some <laughs> other great pictures of seagulls <laughs> yeah, in action so exactly right, look here's the first one it's uh, sid saunders <laughs> sent in this one from sussex um it was a beach where that's your local fisherman being attacked by the seagulls while he's cleaning out his fish box in the sea but if you will clean out your fish box in the sea, then you have to expect such things. Uh, here's another feeding frenzy from Eileen Bacon in Littlehampton. She said that that's a load of black-headed gulls feeding on just one slice of bread that was thrown in. Uh, Sue Spencer got in touch on Facebook to say, oh, I love them. Have a pet one who's visited every year for 12 years between March and October. Good. Part of the family eats with my cats and sits on our legs, look. And sure enough, there is. Uh, some great photos of them in action. This is uh, Jolie Williams sent in this one from Bournemouth of a beautiful combination of blue skies and stormy clouds and one gull sawing there. And Alan Barber from Bognor Regis, glorious sunrise beautiful. or sunset, do you think, with a seagull oh. flying through the sun? And uh, finally, the big question, can birds read? Well, this seagull clearly can't. Or maybe it just doesn't know it's signed. No parking, no waiting, shouldn't be there. All we need now is his forecast. And here he is. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe, Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Now, if you cast your mind back a full oh, week and a half, you'll remember we were in the middle of a very cold spell. Hence, we got some gorgeous pictures like this. They are the ice crystals that had formed on Louise's wall in the dead of a very chilly night. Well, brace yourself for more of the same because we have some cold weather coming our way. We've got a weak weather front that's working its way westwards over the next 24 hours or so, just bringing some cloud, a bit of drizzly rain. But behind, we get high pressure building to the east of us. That's going to keep the weather fronts well and truly at bay. The low pressure system staying way out in the Atlantic. So for us, very settled weather, but very cloudy and not desperately warm. Temperatures struggling by day to get above two, maybe three degrees. For this evening, a few showers knocking around. They've been pushing in from the west. A few more of those to come, but they will tend to fizzle away during the night. Some clear skies too, a bit of patchy mist here and there and a fair bit of cloud developing as we head towards dawn, but still the temperatures dipping down to around two or three degrees. So expect a 
cool start to tomorrow. In fact, I expect it to be a fairly cool day. Fair bit of cloud knocking around. We'll also see that weather front pushing some light, patchy, drizzly rain our way. Nothing too major should fizzle out as the day goes on. But look at those temperatures. Very disappointing to say the least. Five or six towards the north of the region, down towards the coast where it's always that little bit milder. We might just scrape a seven if we're very lucky. Bear in mind that today we had 10 or 11 and some sunshine. So your high tide times, well, you can see on the Isle of Wight around half eight in the morning, five past nine in the evening. And then we turn colder, not just by night, but by day two, twos and threes on Thursday. Euro Tunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. And in just a moment here on ITV, we've got the evening news of Mary Nightingale. Stacey Bull's got our late news. Join her if you can. For now, though, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much, Dave, for watching. Take care. Join us soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Do you remember that picture? <laughs>